Okay, I think I can we can start already. So welcome everyone to Wednesday in Phosphor G 2021. Uh, this is the Concagua Zone. Um, following we will have the dollar presenting handling your tips in current side code with G Day AL and Long. I'm sorry. Well, uh, I let you to proceed with the talk. Okay. Thanks, Jose. Um, so, hi everyone. My name is Derek Dollar. Uh, I am a software engineer at Azavia. We are a uh, professional services firm based in Philadelphia with a focus on um, geospatial work. And I want to talk to you today about um, uh, a library I've written called Loam uh, that uses GDAL to handle um, geotiffs in client-side code, i.e. code that's running in a web browser. Um, so I'm not going to go into what uh, GDAL and geotiffs are, um, because I assume that if you're interested in this talk, uh, you probably know what those two things are already. Uh, if you do have questions about those uh, two things, uh, please you know put in a question and we can talk about it at the end. Um, but so just some background, um, you need uh, GDAL or some other library that supports the GeoTIFF format, uh, such as GeoTrellis or GeoTIFF.js. There are other libraries um, to read GeoTIFFs. It's, it's not a format that's you know, supported by non-GIS um, software. So you need special um, specialized GIS libraries or software in order to read a GeoTIFF. Um, and so if you want to um, integrate uh, geotiffs and spatial data handling into your web application, um, you are going to need to use GDAL most likely. And you historically would need to run that on the server side. GDAL is a C++ uh, library. So uh, there wasn't really a way to run that on the client side. So you would need to um, integrate that into your the server side component, the back end of your web application. Um, and uh, but fairly recently, uh, the WebAssembly standard has uh, started to be supported uh, within web browsers. And there is a, a set of tools called mscripten, uh, which allows compiling C++ libraries into WebAssembly, which then allows running GDAL inside of a browser. So it's now possible to run uh, GDAL in a browser, uh, a client-side environment. So uh, the next question becomes, why would you want to do that? Uh, and so to answer that question, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, drawbacks and some of the um, challenges of um, using uh, GDAL on the server side, because what uh, running it on the client side would do is it's essentially going to be replacing uh, server side handling of geotiffs. So let's look into that a little bit. Um, server side handling of geotiffs, um, this could also apply to other uh, raster formats, but I'm focusing in on geotiffs because they're they're fairly common and, and a lot of people know how to work with them. Um, uh, the first one you have is uh, you have a drawback of infrastructure costs. So uh, when you're running a server, you automatically are going to be paying uh, higher costs in order to uh, support those computing resources. Uh, whereas you can host a, a completely client-side static web app for free uh, these days in, in any number of places. Um, if you want to actually do dynamic processing, you need to have servers. And so that's going to increase your costs. Uh, it's also going to, um, second point, increase your infrastructure complexity. So you need to uh, set up deployment for these servers. Uh, however, you're, you know, however you choose to run them, uh, you need to have a way to install uh, GDAL onto the servers. You need to hook them up to uh, the front end of your application. So you've already increased the complexity and the the maintenance costs of uh, your web application by adding that backend component. And then um, there's uh, also a challenge of user experience. Uh, when you're running on the server, it um, can sometimes uh, force you to structure things in a certain way. And I'll get to that in a second with an example um, that may not provide the best user experience. Um, but on the flip side, uh, there is also a lot of flexibility that you get because you have uh, usually a more powerful machine. You can um, 
architect things the way you want. So when you uh, do your handling on the server, you tend to get a lot of um, flexibility from it. Uh, so here's an example of a feature that uh, I've had to work with in uh, web applications that I've worked on. I'm sure some of you have uh, had to implement a similar feature. Um, so uh, let's say you've got a web application that needs to accept user submitted GeoTIFFs. So users want to upload GeoTIFFs for some reason. Um, on this application. If you're handling those GeoTIFFs um, server side, um, the first thing is you need to validate them after uploading. So you have to upload in order for uh, the GeoTIFFs to be processed or validated because they have to be on the server. Uh, GeoTIFFs can often be quite large. So you can find, users can find themselves sitting for uh, several minutes waiting for a large file to upload and they don't get any validation or feedback uh, until that file has uploaded and you've had a chance to validate it. So that uh, makes the user experience poorer. Uh, similarly, uh, it's hard to provide a preview if you're doing all of your processing on the server side uh, because you have to wait again until the file has been entirely uploaded. Uh, and then once those files are uploaded, uh, if they're large, you are likely going to need to set up uh, some sort of asynchronous task handling in order to process those files uh, because they may be too large to be processed within uh, a request response cycle. So uh, there are some significant limitations if you're uh, working with um, GeoTIFFs or, or other large geospatial files uh, on the server side. However, if you can do it on the client side, um, you can do certain types of validation uh, very quickly in browser and you can provide immediate feedback um, because uh, you're, you've got the file available there uh, instantly. Uh, you can do things like preview the footprint on a map immediately. Um, you could potentially even reprocess the files in your browser and then upload uh, the, the desired format if there's from backend processing that has to happen. You could have that happen on the front end and uh, do the processing while it's uploading. So then uh, by the time the uh, data gets uploaded to the application backend, uh, it's actually already in the format that you need. So uh, I'm going to provide a demo here. Uh, I hope that this, this may not have worked. Can we see this? Yes. No. Sorry, one second. OK, great. Um, so this is a little demo application that uh, we put together uh, to explain how this can work. Um, and this is basically just going to show some information about um, a GeoTIFF that I upload. So I suspect you won't be able to see the file selection dialog, but I'm going to click Browse here. Uh, I'm going to select what is a, a Landsat um, GeoTIFF. Uh, it's a scene from Landsat. Uh, it is just a single band. Uh, it happens to be band eight, um, and it's about 230 megabytes. Um, so when I select this, uh, there's no, not going to be any um, upload process. Uh, we're just going to see some information about this um, fairly large uh, TIFF file, uh, and uh, you'll see that appear on the page. So uh, I am going to click the, uh, the button to submit it right now. And so you can see that that was a fairly instantaneous response. And we've been able to get out some useful information about this GeoTIFF that hasn't been uploaded anywhere. It's just sitting on my local computer. We've got the coordinate system. We've got the size. We've got the band count. Um, we've got uh, the footprint of the, um, the GeoTIFF here that is displayed on a map. So if you were a user uploading this to a web application somewhere and you accidentally clicked the wrong file, um, you would see that here and you'd say, oh, this, this is the wrong file. It's in the wrong place. This isn't the one I meant to upload. So you could more quickly you know, cancel that and restart it. Um, if the band count was wrong, for example, you could see that and you could um, deal with it. Uh, and we've also got uh, the bounding box uh, coordinates. So if you need to um, download those as GeoJSON or um, 
use them in some other way, uh, we've got those available uh, for you here. And so um, in addition to the fact that this is a uh, this is something that provides immediate feedback and it has a good user experience. Um, it also is really easy to scale because it's an entirely static website. So this whole website is completely static. So if you all go to this website right now, uh, I'm not going to be worried about you know scaling or the server getting overloaded or anything like that because it's just it's just static files and so there's there's nothing really that needs to be um, that needs to be scaled up or there's no resources that need to be changed if there's a lot of users all trying to use it at the same time. It'll just keep on running um, no matter what and you all all will have a good experience even if there's lots and lots of people using it. Um, okay, so I am going to switch this back. Sorry, one moment. Okay. All right. Oh, that got. Well, technical difficulties. Sorry about that. I think that should be good. Um, I'm just going to leave this in the regular uh, mode. Um, so what is Loam? Um, Loam is a client-side GDAL wrapper. So you may have worked with other clients or other wrappers for GDAL. Um, Loam is a client-side um, wrapper that's designed to run in a browser environment using GDAL that's been compiled to WebAssembly. Um, so let's look at some code. Uh, so uh, to open a file you know, with GDAL, um, you need to use GDAL open to open it if you've uh, ever used the GDAL API. Uh, and the same happens with Loam. Uh, you need to provide it a file object like a user might select from their file system, or you can also provide it with a blob. So if you've got um, something that's getting downloaded as binary from somewhere, it may show up as a blob. You can also pass in a blob. And you just do loam.open, and then you give it the file. Uh, if you then want to do something with that file, you can use, um, uh, you have a number of uh, functions that you can call on your data set. So when you do loam.open, you get a promise uh, that provides you with a data set. So that's this DS here. And then if you want to call um, width and height on that data set, uh, you can call ds.width, ds.height, and then you can, um, those both return promises. You can wait on both of those promises, and then you can do something with that data. So everything in the API uh, returns a promise. A um, little bit more of a complex uh, example, uh, GDAL Translate is available. So you can pass in uh, all of the parameters that you would use on the command line for GDAL Translate. You can pass those into uh, a function call in loams. So for example, uh, we've got, um, it's called convert uh, in loam and you can, um, this is an example of converting a geotiff into a PNG file. So it is um, using uh, bands one, two, and three for RGB. It's setting the out format to PNG, resizing to 512, uh, using nearest neighbor resampling and scaling the histogram. 
And one important thing to note about this is that um, altering data sets evaluate lazily. So if you do this, um, then the promise that's returned will actually evaluate immediately, uh, but no processing is going to happen. Uh, so you can call convert again, you can warp, you can do other alterations on that data set that you've created, sort of like a VRT, if you're familiar with those. Um, you can do things to it, um, but nothing is actually going to get processed until you try to access some data uh, from that data set. So in this case, the example is getting the bytes of the data set uh, in order to probably display it somewhere. Um, once you call bytes, then that whole um, lazily generated data set is evaluated at that point when you try to make the access. What else can you do with it? Um, there's another, uh, quite a few other things that are supported right now. Um, in theory, anything that uh, could be supported by GDAL could be supported by Loam, um, but uh, the wrappers have to be uh, written, so not everything is there yet. But here's here are the things that are currently supported. Um, there's support for using Proj4 to reproject arrays of points uh, between projections defined by WKT. Um, so that's one thing you can do. Uh, you've got access to GDAL Translate, as I mentioned, so you can resize uh, files, you can change the format, adjust the compression, adjust the band type, reorder the bands, and, and many other things. Um, you've also got access to GDAL Warp, uh, so you can use that to warp uh, some an image uh, between projections. Uh, you can also do some windowing to select subsets of a file. Uh, there's also GDAL Dem available, so you can do hill shading, uh, you can do color mapping, slope, and anything else that GDAL Dem uh, is capable of doing. And then there's also GDAL Rasterize. Uh, so you can, if you have GeoJSON in your uh, web map, uh, in your mapping application somewhere, and you want to turn that into a raster image, you could use GDAL Rasterize um, to uh, create a raster, a rasterized version of that GeoJSON. Uh, so I hope at this point that you are thinking, wow, this sounds pretty amazing, but you know, uh, there have to be limitations for everything. So, so what are they? Um, and there's a few. Uh, so the first uh, limitation, uh, I think the, the previous uh, presenter touched on this a little bit, uh, is that um, within a browser, you have some constraints because you're running in a browser environment. So the first one uh, that is notable here is memory constraints. Um, if you're running on a, a large machine, you've got many gigabytes of memory available. You have an ability to write temporary data to the disk. So even if you run out of memory, you can process uh, a large file. Um, in a browser, the browser environment is very uh, tightly constrained. And so you can't like dump large files to disk. You don't have really any swap space or like spare disk space available to access to the application. You just have to run within whatever the browser gives you. So um, if you're if you're memory limited, um, that's pretty much all you've got. You've got the memory you can work with and and you can't get any more. So for like very large files, um, you might have a difficult time working with large files in a browser. Although GDAL is really quite good at running with uh, limited memory, so you might be surprised at how far you can push it. Um, there's other also limits on HTTP requests. Uh, so I know a lot of people like to use um, VSI curl within uh, GDAL, and that's not currently available um, in, in a browser environment. Uh, I think there's a good path towards making that available, but it's it's not currently there yet. Um, you can, however, make the requests yourself uh, via JavaScript and then pass the results, pass the um, response from that request as a blob to GDAL. So that's still possible. Uh, a third limitation is bandwidth. So uh, you know, in order to make your website load quickly, you want assets to be as small as possible. Um, GDAL is a fairly large library. Uh, it's the the assets for GDAL are about 2.2 megabytes compressed. Um, so there's there's a lot that needs to get downloaded. Luckily, you can download that lazily at some other point when the web page loads, after the web page loads. So you don't need to uh, load all of that on the initial page load. It's not going to slow down um, your initial page load all that much, but um, it does need to get loaded at some point. And if you've got a slow connection, that could be problematic. Uh, and then the fourth point is that uh, WebAssembly uh, and web workers, which Loam also uses, are relatively on the newer side for technology. So people who uh, are trying to use uh, Loam and uh, WebAssembly web workers uh, inside 
uh, a standard web application that was built with React or Webpack or some other uh, front end framework or bundler uh, often struggle with getting the build tools to correctly um, deal with those, those assets and those files. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, uh, not all of the GDAL methods are wrapped yet. We can't use auto-generated or existing JavaScript wrappers uh, because it's executing in an entirely different execution environment because it's in a browser. So you can't just use the existing um, wrapper for Node.js that's that's in JavaScript. You can't just transfer that over to the browser and have it, expect it to work. Um, so uh, if you're wondering how you can help, um, which I hope you are, uh, there was a fellow just a few days ago who opened uh, a PR to add uh, functions for OGR, Ogre. Um, so uh, if you want to add things to it, I'm very welcoming of uh, pull requests uh, or issues if you need something. Uh, and that's basically it. Um, if you want to learn how to install it, it's just npm install loam. Uh, the repo is, uh, the link is right there. Um, and then uh, gdal.js is the WebAssembly port of gdal or compilation of gdal, and that's the link to that repository. Um, and now I can open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you for that amazing talk, Edek. And yeah, let's see the questions that a few posted up. So let's start with this one. <clears throat> Is it possible to open all the just partial file formats that the AL supports? Um, yeah, it is. So the file formats that are currently supported are um, GeoTIFF, JPEG, and uh, PNG on the raster side. And then on the vector side, anything that's built in uh, when you compile GDAL uh, is uh, supported. Uh, but not all of the wrappers are quite there yet. Um, that will actually come when that pull request to add the OGR functions is um, is finished. Uh, in theory, it's possible to support anything that GDAL supports, um, but do in order to keep the bundle size low, um, you saw it was 2.2 megabytes uh, compressed. If you add in other libraries, that's going to uh, further increase the bundle size. So I've opted not to uh, compile in support for any other file formats besides uh, those ones that I just mentioned. Um, but uh, it would certainly be possible to create, um, to compile your own version uh, into WebAssembly using the, the repo um, for GDAL.js. Um, if you need to have, for example, NetCDF support, um, you could uh, create your own uh, compilation. You could uh, include uh, compile in netcd the the library for netcdf support, um, and then uh, loam doesn't really care about what gdal can support, and so loam would be able to uh, use that uh, just as if it was any other file, as long as the the gdal compilation, the compiled version of gdal behind it, uh, supported that. All right, thanks. Next question. Uh... Is this one as a I support in the development of the project currently? I'm sorry, is what supported? Uh, Azabea. Azabea. Oh, Azavia, yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry. No, it's okay. No one no one pronounces it correctly the first time. Um, so I am uh, working on this project. Uh, Azavia has a 10% time research uh, program so Azavia uh, employees can use 10% of our time to work on research projects. So I've been um, using my 10% time to um, work on the project. Uh, I've had some collaboration from um, other Azavia employees, and there have been some uh, folks outside of the company who have worked on it. Um, but it's uh, it's it's being indirectly supported by Azavia through that program, um, and and but it's uh, it's sort of my initiative. Awesome. Okay, and I think we have time for another question. Mm, how does performance? Uh, how does its performance compare with GeoTIFF GS? Yeah, 
That's a great question. Um, I haven't directly compared it to geotiff.js. I haven't tried to set up a, a benchmark, but I can talk about some of the differences between the two libraries. Um, geotiff.js is written in pure JavaScript, as far as I'm aware, uh, and it just focuses on reading data from geotiffs. So it's much, much smaller in terms of um, the dependencies that you're downloading. It's just a very small library that uh, allows you to read geotiffs. So you only have a few kilobytes of data that you're reading, uh, that you're downloading, compared to uh, GDAL, which is 2.2 megabytes compressed. So there's a big difference in terms of the size of the payload that you're downloading. Um, so that's the first point. Uh, the second point, is that uh, GDAL includes all of GDAL. So with um, geotiff.js, once you've got the data, it's sort of up to you what you want to do with it. If you want to render it in a certain way, convert it to another format, do something else with it, you have to sort of make that decision on your own and write that code on your own. Um, if you're using GDAL, uh, you get access to uh, a lot of the things that GDAL has built in already. So it's more, it's like a much more full featured um, library, but again, with the drawback that you pay for that, uh, those extra features because of the larger size that you're downloading. Um, and then the last point is that um, uh, GDAL is written or GDAL is compiled to WebAssembly. In theory, WebAssembly should be, uh, in most cases, uh, faster than a JavaScript library. But uh, in some of the tests that, that I've done, I've seen that that's not always the case. So I think that the best thing to do if you wanted to compare the two would be to sort of attempt to, to implement the, the specific uh, computation that you're interested in uh, and to compare them side by side. Okay, thank you very much. And I think that we have run out of time for questions. So I think that we will have to say farewell right now. So thank you very much, Derek, for your talk and for coming to First of G. And we will say um, we will be seeing you around uh, today, right? Yes. Thank you very much. See you soon. Goodbye.